from Photonics Media, this is the podcast that takes listeners inside the physical science of light. As we explore groundbreaking and industry-shaping progress in lasers, optics, imaging, metrology, and sensing. Each episode, our hosts welcome optics and photonics luminaries, rising stars, and market leaders for robust discussion about the trends shaping the field of photonics. From research and development to commercial innovation, we're on the air for unparalleled insight, offered on All Things Photonics. All Things Photonics is brought to you by PolyScience and LumenCore. Today's episode is brought to you by PolyScience. For over 60 years, the PolyScience line of award-winning temperature control equipment has been helping the photonics industry reach its goals safely and efficiently. Our products are made in America and delivered globally. Please visit polyscience.com to learn how we can help you. Changing the world of chillers is more than a tagline. It's part of our history. Today's episode is also brought to you by LumenCore. LumenCore excels in the manufacture of technical lighting, scanners and imagers, and metrology. Visit us at LumenCore.com to see how we can best support your new products and OEM production. First described in 1844, solitons are nonlinear, self-reinforcing localized wave packets that propagate freely at a constant velocity and are capable of recovering even after collisions with other such wave packets. More than a century and a quarter after their description, Bell Labs' Akira Hasegawa theorized that solitons could exist in optical fiber. Our guest today is credited with discovering optical quartic solutions. He's also the former head of silicon photonics research at Nokia Bell Labs and served as Optica's director at large from 2020 to 2022. Currently an endowed professor at UCF, Creel, Andrea Blanco Redondo's research in addressing some of the world's most exciting topics in the field has taken flight. Some of these topics are just dipping their toes into the commercial market, while others stand very solidly in the realm of R&D, eagerly awaited by industry. Solitons provide the backbone of many laser technologies, particularly those that support datacom applications, but some of their most enticing opportunities remain to be realized. Redondo is active in researching slow light, which may sound like an oxymoron, but its study holds great promise for applications in quantum computing. Also in the quantum realm is her ongoing work in topology. Many of us have seen mind-bending video clips using knots to demonstrate topological concepts, but what does it mean for photonics? In today's conversation, we'll take a bird's-eye view of these areas of research and explore their impact on industry, whether current or potential. Up next, news editor Joel Williams speaks with Andrea Blanco Redondo, Florida Photonics Center of Excellence and Dad Professor at UCF Creel. So solitons is an area of photonics that we're starting to see come up more and more often when we're looking through the latest research advantage, uh, excuse me, advances. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to be honest, it's an area that we're a little bit in the dark about, uh, and I suspect it might be the same for many of the folks in our audience. Uh, So for those of us who aren't so familiar with solitons, could you give us just kind of a quick explanation of, you know, what they are and why they're important? Absolutely, yes. Um, So solitons are these uh, very stable pulses that propagate unchanged for very long distances, right? So they can survive collisions with other solitons and other perturbations while maintaining their shape. And the best thing is that uh, they do it on their own, right? So they are self-forming and and self-preserving. So now solitons, um, as you probably know, uh, do not exist only in optics. They exist in many other physical systems, right, such as neural systems, for example, or or water waves. And indeed, solitons were discovered in in water uh, in the 1800s. And that is probably still the most intuitive system for us to envision solitons, right? So imagine a heap of water that propagates unchanged without spreading or without changing in any other way for a very long distance. Well, that is a soliton for you. Right. So um, you may be wondering, OK, how, how do we achieve this? How does a soliton form? Right. So uh, just bringing it down to uh, back to optics uh, in a waveguide, say an optical fiber, for example, there are two important effects that uh, affect pulse propagation. We have dispersion, which uh, basically causes different frequencies of light, different colors to travel at different speeds. 
And you have nonlinearity that occurs at high light intensity, and it generates uh, new frequencies that were not originally part of the pulse. Well, if the dispersion has the right shape, and if the light intensity is high enough, then dispersion and nonlinearity can perfectly balance each other, fully compensate each other, and leave the poles completely unchanged. And that is how a soliton comes about, right? So now to your question, uh, why are they important? Well, uh, they are important from a fundamental point of view, of course, because they uh, illustrate nonlinear physics and, and dispersion beautifully and allow us to understand and explain phenomena observed in vastly different fields of physics. But they are also very important uh, because they, they really underpin uh, many of the technologies uh, based on, on nonlinear optics. Actually, I was wondering if you could uh, if you could expand on that. Uh, you know, some of those technologies that are um, you know based on nonlinear optics uh, that solitons are involved in. Absolutely, yes. So um, you know, it might not be fully obvious to the end user, but solitons actually are, are hugely important in, in certain technologies and applications. For instance, uh, lasers based on solitons are the simplest and most efficient kind of mode-locked laser. So a mode-locked laser is a laser that produces a train of short optical pulses, right? Um, and these optical pulses are actually often solitons. So as uh, your audience may know, uh, mode lock lasers have a wide range of applications, right? From basic research to industrial applications, for example, in, in spectroscopy or uh, biomedical imaging, right? Um, another hugely important and impactful uh, application or technology, perhaps, uh, based on solitons is uh, frequencies, frequency comms. Uh, this is a Nobel Prize uh, winning technology, right? Uh, for the Nobel Prize in physics in 2005 uh, was given to uh, inventors or you know, demonstrators of this technology. Uh, so frequency comps are basically lasers that act as, they act as rulers of, of light, right? This means that they can measure optical frequencies very precisely. So because of these, they are used for timekeeping, for instance. And the most accurate uh, clocks that we have nowadays are clocks based on atomic transitions, right? And these transitions are, are often are optical frequencies, right? Which are very high in the range of hundreds of, of terahertz or even higher, right? And at these frequencies, our, our electronic system just can't keep up, right? So, so we have to switch to optical techniques such as uh, the frequency comb to count these oscillations very precisely, right? So that allow us to keep time um, in the most accurate manner, which is crucial these days for like GPS applications, for example, or, or market trade, right? Among other things. Uh, now, one thing I should mention though, is that um, soliton laser technologies, despite being very efficient and very stable, they also have important limitations. Uh, these limitations are related to the energy that can be contained in the soliton pulse, right? So since solitons have a very well-defined shape, uh, the energy contained in a soliton pulse of a given duration is fixed, right? This means we usually cannot generate soliton lasers that deliver very high energies. And that prevents uh, their use on certain applications such as uh, machining or laser surgery, for example, right? So this is a problem that, that um, our team uh, at UCF is actually trying to uh, address right now, right? So remember when I told you earlier that solitons arise from a balance of dispersion and nonlinearity? Well, uh, yeah, that is true, but um, dispersion comes in different flavors, right? And and we can use this to our advantage. Uh, so uh, when the soliton laser was demonstrated in the early 80s at uh, uh, Bell Labs uh, in New Jersey, where I worked until recently, actually, uh, the researchers used the most common kind of dispersion in which the group velocity of the poles changes with frequency following a quadratic relation. Okay, so uh, this is the dispersion that has been used to produce solitons since their inception, basically. Uh, but a few years ago, we realized that we can use other types of dispersion to create solitons, like a dispersion in which the group velocity scales with the four power of the frequency, or even higher powers, right? 
And it turns out that these types of solitons can carry much higher uh, energy at solar polarizations, and we can leverage uh, the, the simplicity of, of soliton lasers uh, while uh, hopefully being able to achieve uh, higher energy per pulse. I wanted to go back to one one thing you said um, that the sort of the nature of solitons means that they're uh, they're difficult to apply to uh, applications like uh, like machining and uh, I think you said medical applications. Uh, uh, I said laser surgery, for example, any right, any application right. that requires a high energy per pulse. Right. Uh, I was wondering what uh, what would make them desirable for the uh, for those applications. Absolutely, yes. So uh, mostly the fact that they are self-forming and self-preserving, right? Uh, that means that if you have the right, uh, take for example, the right optical fiber, right? Uh, that's all you need. You just need to adjust the power levels and the soliton will form uh, on its own. It will uh, gain a very well-defined shape, a transform limited pulse, uh, which is basically the shortest uh, possible pulse for a given um, a bandwidth. Uh, and it just forms on its own, right? So this means that uh, the laser system does not require any additional uh, recompression stage or any additional stage that basically takes the poles uh, to the shape that you wanted, to the duration that you wanted, right? So they are simple, they're efficient, and they are stable. So that's what makes soliton lasers very desirable. Very interesting. Uh, and this question, I'm going to have to <laughs> sort of adjust on the fly because we um, we already sort of answered it a little bit. Um, but so, uh, you know, our coverage here at, you know, Photonics Media, it's a little bit scant on solitons. Uh, you yeah. know, one of the reasons being, you know, sort of our uh, B2B nature, uh, our research, you know, it tends to focus on technologies that are nearing commercialization or of uh, direct implications for the industry. Uh, though, as we've sort of noted, you know, uh, even though, you know, solitons may sort of be in the background a little bit, they are definitely uh, affecting the industry. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it, it still, it seems to be that they're very much in the experimental side of things. Uh, what I guess uh, what I would want to ask is, you know, what are some what are some things that you're seeing in soliton research uh, that you think would be important for the uh, uh, for the industry? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I think we kind of skipped ahead there, right? right. Because we were, we were talking about it just recently. I think uh, just you know, more generally speaking, uh, really uh, lasers and and in particular pulsed lasers are really the the, the main realm of application of solitons, right? Um, now, uh, just to mention a few other things that perhaps we we haven't really covered yet, right? Uh, as we were mentioning, uh, solitons are very important in the formations of frequency comps, right? Um, it's not the only way, but it's one of the most important ways. And um, one important uh, technology that has become uh, quite significant in the last decade or so is this microresonator frequency comps. These are frequency comps on chip. Uh, they're tiny and they can be integrated in a smartphone or in any other uh, device in which the footprint is really limited, right? Um, now, those devices, apart from like the classic uses of uh, frequency comps like timekeeping or, or frequency metrology, uh, have other applications that are being uh, investigated right now, like, for example, telecommunications, right? Um, these frequency comms basically emit uh, many frequency lines that we can use as individual lasers, for instance, right? So in a telecom system in which you have many wavelengths, for example, in wavelength division multiplexing systems, uh, you can, in principle, use just one laser system to provide many different uh, frequency signals that you could modulate individually, right? So that is one of the um, investigations uh, that are going on right now in terms of applications of, of solitons uh, on chip, right? Uh, just to give you another example uh, on top of the mode lock lasers that we discussed later uh, earlier, sorry. Awesome. Uh, so sort of switching gears here, um, you know, one of the things 
that really attracted us to your work uh, is that it focuses on areas that, you know, we're not really particularly well versed in, but, you know, are just kind of sort of inherently really interesting. Uh, you know, one example, of course, being slow light. Um, you know, obviously, one of the things that light is known for is that it's incredibly fast, uh, and that's, you know, one of its main draws as a tool uh, in technology. You know, telecom, LIDAR, lasers, imaging, uh, and so on, they all benefit from how fast light moves. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little bit about the concept of slow light uh, in you know, what are some of the benefits of slowing down uh, light? Yes, yeah, so you're, you're very right. So many of the advantages of working with light, with, with photons, is the fact that they that light travels incredibly fast, faster than anything we know, right? So light can travel around the world 7.5 times in a second. Imagine that, right? So this enables, as you mentioned, right, like swift transmission of information across the globe, right? For example, via optical fibers and at a much smaller scale uh, within photonic chips. Uh, which enables much faster processing of information in data centers, for instance. However, because light travels so fast, it also becomes inherently hard to control and to process. So for certain applications, uh, we might be interested in slowing light down. So uh, slow light is an effect where uh, the information carried by light travels more slowly, way more slowly, than the speed of light in vacuum, which is the well-known constant C, right? 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, and a slow light can be achieved in many different ways, but the main idea behind, I would say all of them, is to leverage dispersion. Again, the idea that uh, different frequencies of a pulse travel at different speed, right? It can be the material dispersion or, or the wavelength dispersion, but uh, that is the idea behind it at the end of the day. So uh, regarding the benefits and potential usages of slow light, I suppose the most obvious is uh, really light storage. So if we manage to slow light down in a significant and controllable way, we could potentially build memories for photons, much like the memories in your computer, right, that store electronic states. Um, another interesting use of uh, slow light that I have personally explored in my research is the enhancement of uh, nonlinear uh, optical effects, right? As, as we mentioned, uh, nonlinear optical effects occur at high intensities, right? So usually very light, very high light intensities are required to produce significant uh, nonlinear optical functionality that could be used in a device. However, if we manage to slow down our photons, then the interaction of light and matter, which is really what underpins nonlinearity, becomes much stronger. And we can use this to produce low power nonlinear devices, right? That would be much more attractive for real applications. A big caveat here um, is that slow light is usually very lossy, right? So since we are increasing the interaction of light and matter by slowing those photons down, we are also increasing the possibilities for the photons to get absorbed, to get scattered, right? So to do to this date, uh, the, the the problem of loss in slow light is uh, still an ongoing problem that the research community is trying to address, and that is probably why we do not see uh, many applications of slow light in the real world. I'm curious, what are some of the avenues that are being uh, explored to sort of uh, prevent those issues with uh, with loss and scattering? Uh, that is a very good question. Well, it usually relies on, on the technique that we use to slow down the light, right? Uh, so one of them is just playing with uh, meta surfaces or, you know, very nano engineered uh, structures that change the dispersion, but do not introduce excessive loss. And this is as opposed to other techniques that use more the material dispersion based on uh, absorptions, absorption resonances of the material itself. Um, yeah, I think that that would be the main line, yeah. Right. 
Uh, now, one of the one of the areas that are uh, sort of a little bit more closer uh, to commercialization, uh, but you know, still an area that's uh, requiring a lot of heavy research uh, is uh, quantum. Uh, and one of the things that you're known for is demonstrating topological protection of quantum states. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that work? Uh, and you know, what exactly does it mean to provide topological protection? Sure thing. Um, let me start by by explaining what topology means in this context, right? Which right. may or may not be obvious. A topology is a property that cannot be changed under small deformations, right? Under small continuous changes. It can only be changed by a very abrupt, very robust perturbation, right? So take, for instance, the number of holes of a geometrical object, a donut has one hole in it. It has a topology of one. We can perform small changes to it. Just imagine the donut was were made out of Play-Doh, right? So we could slowly deform it into a mug that also has one hole in the handle. Uh, and then the mug also has a topology of one. So we haven't changed the topology. We have performed the small deformations and we haven't changed the topology. However, if we wanted to turn our donut into a pair of glasses, for instance, that has two holes, imagine a topology of two, then we would need to perform a very abrupt change. For example, punching a hole through our shape, right? We could never achieve that with small deformations. And that is what topology uh, basically, uh, that, that, that explain why topologies are very robust uh, quantities uh, of a system as a whole, right? What does this have to do with photonics, right? You may be wondering. Okay, so photonic platforms also possess topologies, properties that are very robust. Only that these topologies do not exist in the real space. We cannot see them by just looking at the photonic device. They exist in their dispersion relation, which determines again how different frequencies of light propagate through a photonic structure. So an important characteristic of these topological photonic structures is that they support modes that are very robust to small defects, right? We say that these modes are topologically protected because they arise from a topology of the photonic system as a whole, right? It's a global property. And therefore, they're really not affected uh, by, by local defects, right? So within this whole field of uh, topological photonics, I have been working on creating this kind of topological waveguides in photonic chips. Uh, and specifically, my work has focused on using topology to protect quantum properties of light, such as uh, correlations and entanglement between photons. And these quantum properties are at the core of uh, very important uh, technologies, such as quantum computing. And I'm hoping that my work will contribute to make uh, photonic quantum computing architectures more robust to small nanofabrication defects and other environmental changes and uh, in this way to contribute to the scalability of these systems so that they can be made bigger because they are more resilient to defects. Excellent. And now, sticking with topology, one of your more recent works, uh, which was published in uh, Nature Communications, uh, proposes a programmable integrated photonics platform that allows uh, implementation, reconfiguring, and accurate characterization of a large variety of topological models. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what it means to have that level of control and understanding over topological models? Yes, so this is one of our latest published research and we're very excited about it. What we are proposing and demonstrating is a universal platform to implement topological photonic systems. So until recently, people have had to resort to specific platforms to test uh, different kinds of ideas, different kinds of topological systems. And on top of that, these systems uh, really lacked uh, any kind of reconfigurability. But we have demonstrated that uh, programmable integrated photonics, which is a technology that was created with a complete different set of applications in mind, right? Like uh, microwave photonics or um, photonic artificial intelligence, right? We have demonstrated that that technology can serve 
as a uh, universal playground to virtually implement any topological system and with total reconfigurability, right? So the implications of this are that now you do not need to have the latest fabrication techniques at your disposal to produce new breakthroughs on topological photonics. You can just have one programmable uh, integrated photonic chip that allows you to test uh, many different ideas that you may have. And uh, also because of this uh, full reconfigurability, you can fully optimize your system and more precisely, you can fully optimize the properties of these uh, robust uh, topological electromagnetic modes of your topological waveguides, so to speak, right? Uh, so uh, via this optimization process, we think that we can really contribute to uh, accelerating progress in uh, the development of applications based on topological photonics. Excellent. Uh, now, what is what does that uh, mean for the quantum industry? Uh, you know, what sorts of uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, different firms focusing on uh, different things, quantum sensing and quantum uh, computing. Uh, you know, what sorts of uh, firms would benefit uh, from that sort of technology? And you know, what's what are maybe a couple of specific examples of things that they'd be able to test out? Sure. So uh, probably in the shortest term, the most direct application of what we're doing is related to companies that are investigating photonic quantum computing. And I have a couple of names in mind, uh, but these companies are facing the problem that Sure, we can use uh, photonics to generate quantum states of light, to transport these quantum states of light, but once you scale this up to a size in which you can actually address important problems that you can solve with quantum computing, you start facing the problem that, well, now small imperfections in your devices that are devices on chip for the most part, uh, are actually degrading the fidelity of your quantum states and eventually they limit how big your chip can be made, right? And that limits the problems that you can uh, tackle with uh, quantum computing. So that's probably the first uh, application that comes to mind. Another slightly less direct application, but also important is that topology, uh, uh, sorry, um, photonics is the most convenient system to test topological ideas, right? So these ideas actually stem from condensed matter physics, from these systems that are incredibly hard to engineer and, and to make work really, right? So in photonics, we have a playground and now with our uh, programmable integrated photonic platform even more, uh, that is extremely convenient to uh, test ideas that can actually impact uh, topological system in other uh, in other uh, physical platforms, right? Like in, I'm thinking about electronic platforms, right? And you may have heard of uh, Majorana fermiums, for example, right? Uh, that's one of the uh, technologies uh, cons being considered for uh, quantum computing. Obviously, these are um, fermionic systems, not bosonic systems like photons are, but there are many interesting ideas that we can test in photonics that can be later translated to other systems that are much harder to engineer. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Members of our listening audience have likely acquainted themselves with Fikentech, the photonics test and assembly firm headquartered in Occam, Germany, offers lab-to-fab assembly support as well as automated inspection and control capabilities. As such, the company is well established for applications ranging from LiDAR and optical sensing to telecom and consumer electronics devices. The company's brain trust has another endeavor under its control, and like Fikentech, it too spans technology areas. Elas Technologies Investment is a capital firm providing financial backing for high-tech companies in the photonics space. Its portfolio and global network extend beyond Europe to support high-tech innovation at global scale. In my conversation with Torsten Varenkamp, co-founder and CEO of both Elas and Feigentech, and Matthias Trinker, 
Elas and Fikentech co-founder and CFO of Fikentech, the notion of global scale takes on a leading role. With insights into the inner workings of early-stage investment, Varun Kamp and Trinker also break down the complexities of establishing and sustaining commercial growth amid the different economic and regulatory landscapes that dot the high-tech ecosystem. What we hear provides at once both encouragement and curiosity. Technical innovation is a continuum with opportunities ripe in photonics, and yet there are definite challenges to the ability of young companies to chart a course to success in the sector. Some bottlenecks are byproducts of our time, while still others are inherent hurdles to business prosperity. Of course, the perspectives in this conversation are industry-leading, and for this reason, of high value to our listeners all along the value chain. We begin with an intro into Alas. Okay. I want to begin uh, introducing Alas in its Alas, correct? Yep. Okay. So I'd like to begin by introducing Elas through a lens that also considers Fikin Tech, separate entities but with the same brain power. So to begin, I was hoping to, to hear from you the relationship between the established Fikin Tech and this newer investment arm. So Matthias, do you want to start or? No, uh, you, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so actually, um, uh, the, the, the sequence of event was uh, that the um, um, Ficantech um, was not before ELAS, so uh, it's actually uh, ex- coexisted for a long, long time already because ELAS is, uh, um, is and was the holding company of Ficantech. Okay. So with, with this vehicle, um, we did uh, already f- for a long time investments into, uh, into companies which were adjacent uh, to the business we do with uh, Ficantech as well as in other companies um, um, which uh, are in our photonics network. So the history of both companies already coexisted for, I think, in in total now 10 years. And it's been a beneficial relationship. Obviously, Alas has uh, evolved somewhat, but so has Fikentech. What's the relationship been between the two companies? Has one helped the other grow or has it been a, a symbiotic relationship that way? So, um, yeah. Um, we started with Spycontech first, more than 20 years ago, and with the size of uh, uh, Spycontech was growing, um, we used ELAS as an investment vehicle already. And uh, from a type of business, it's totally independent. Uh, ELAS was just uh, uh, founded in order to have a holding structure with different companies besides. and. Uh, so this is the only interference that uh, as us as person, uh, the owner of uh, Falconek in the old days and the owner of um, Elas. And Elas is what for us is, is now the, the future company for, for our few, uh, uh, expansion and business corporations. Fair enough. Okay, so that's helpful context. Uh, anytime you're in the commercial sector of any um, technology area, be they in photonics or anywhere else, you constantly have an eye on what's next, what's now, what has passed. For someone with a an arm in investment, what are the technology areas that you two look at as sort of the, the promising future in the photonic space? So with, um, with ELAS, we have um, the, the scheme that we only invest into stuff we understand. <laughs> and that is that strongly is is photonics based. So um, and uh, with with uh, Ficantec, uh, with our long long term engagement in Ficantec, we always had a very good eye on what's happening in photonics all over the world. Uh, um, we we were equipping literally everybody in the world when it comes to automated test and and uh, assembly solutions. So we were talking to all these photonics companies at a very early stage. So. We know exactly what's happening in the photonics industry, and we see that this is the future for the um, for the years to come. Uh, we 100% believe that uh, photonics will grow, uh, first of all, as an enabling company, a, a technology um, for other businesses, but also on a complete own sector. So, and that's exactly what we're doing, and we're investing. You mentioned this this uh, twenty years ago uh, benchmark, I suppose, and this this goes back to the early days of Fikentech. 
photonics 20 years ago and photonics now, uh, vastly different technology spaces. What changes have surprised you the most or have been the most um, pleasant surprises maybe is a better question. The pleasant surprises was uh, definitely when we when we started um, uh, Ficontech, uh, silicon photonics or integrated photonics was already a buzzword. So everybody talked about it, um, but nothing happened. And um, I would say, especially over the last five years, it's really the thriving, thriving industry for 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 Ficontech, but also for for Elas. Um, and uh, we see that there will be so much uh new applications enabled with with having that as a as a base new uh, as a base technology either in indium phosphide or silicon or or mass in in, in um, um silicon nitride uh, there's um, that it, it will enable things we cannot dream of today and and i think these fast developments specifically over the last year was a surprise to us um i mean a positive very very positive surprise um, additionally, um, the move in quantum uh, quantum optics, um, even though it, that it, it, it propagates in waves, um, I, I think that it's there to stay and to grow um, significantly. I just think again about Fikin Tech and the buzzwords there for me, and I, it could be different for someone else, test and measurement and automation. Those are two that come to mind fairly quickly. And those specifically have changed a lot in the last 20, 25 years. And, and you know that just as well as anybody. How do you advise young companies today that have a promising technology that you understand, um, but it's a promising technology now? How do you advise them to look towards the future? Because that's obviously very important as well. So, <laughs> Matthias, do you want to start with that, or yeah, maybe we can start with an ex with an example. When so we believed in the market from our uh, based on our experience because we were co uh, workers at Siemens. Uh, there we get to know each other, and this is how it started. And uh, we we believed in the market of photonics, but when we founded the company. Three months later, the market disappeared, more or less, because uh, it was where the telecom bubble uh, exploded. So, um, and we never gave up the belief in the company. So we had a difficult time and we believed in it and, we, uh, and, and continued because we knew it will come and uh, it came back much, much better as, 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 as thought and expected. And this is, uh, Photonic is a, a great uh, market and the, the technology is, is, is uh, as said, the, this technology for, for this century. And we are still at the beginning of this century. And, uh, and so once you have an idea and once you, you, you see, okay, th these are the potential, you never should give up. You just should hold on to the idea uh, because it's always a matter of giving up as uh, of, of failing that the business is failing based on the on, on the on, on the market. And, and uh, to, to add on that, it's rather e easy to convince us on the te technical necessity of a new development. Um, rather than you have the right team, because uh, this is exactly uh, what the the team or the founder team has to transport. It's the willingness to go also through very difficult times without giving up. And and uh, and it is, it's not about our money, but in general, investors' money, um, just to give it uh, give it up easily. If you can, I mean, are there, is there a grouping or, or a, a bucket of common challenges that face a company uh, looking to expand or break into market space in 2024? What, what we see pretty often is that, is that technology is there. Um, they have good, um, uh, good ideas um, and also technology is already somehow either in a, in a demonstration phase that you can see, OK, it will work. But the the sales component of that of that companies is always uh, or often missing. So how do you really get it into the market? What is the what is the the strategy in order to to market 
it in a way that the whole the company will um, um, will survive and grow with it. Is there a, a, an avenue for coaching in that regard that uh, has to happen outside of LS? I mean, are you working with other uh, networks besides just the companies to get the companies that necessary aspect of coaching or of team building or something in that area that isn't just the technology? So what we provide for our uh, investments is a platform um, which goes oh, uh, um, above and beyond uh, Europe. Because that's where we're strong, where we have a lot of contacts, where we have a lot of networking. Um, we're currently founding um, Elas China, that is um, to to offer our investments a platform there, and the same we're going to do also in the US. So we we, we, we consider um, in in the uh, literature it, it's called born global. So this technology uh, and the startups are born global in that way that. The market is right from the beginning global and the, the way of thinking and the company has to be prepared for that. And th this is why we believe that we have a good network, which is not only restricted to certain areas. So we can really say that uh, because of this 20 years of experience, uh, we have everywhere around the uh, on the globe uh, contacts, which we could provide provide also to our uh, companies. As you're providing the platform, is there a degree of consideration that goes into geographies? And I ask because if you're dealing with you know companies that are receiving money from EU initiatives versus Chinese governmental initiatives, perhaps I don't know what those would be, but you, know, you also have companies in North America. Um, is there a consideration there to just the different geographical landscape in the photonics world? Um, for sure that. It Yes, yes, definitely. There is a there's this and that, that makes makes the the areas um, where the where the companies are are active um, makes it a little bit uh, um, scattered and and a lot. European company is very European focused, where U.S. company in the beginning is is very U.S. Uh, uh, focused. Uh, that has a lot to do with with fundings and and the 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 buckets of money coming uh, where the money is coming from. Um, and I don't think that there's a Good way out of it right now. That's like we we have, for example, in in uh, an investment into a, a quantum uh, key distribution company. It's, it's the nature of the business is already kind of um, um, localized. So that's that's the 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 effort of the team then to make it uh, you know or to bring it to the global market. And do you find young companies have this understanding or is this an area of explanation that has to come from Elas typically? Um, because this is a considerable challenge, right? The, the, the nature of geographical uh, um, influence. I would say it's very diversified. It's, it's, it's always depending on the team. Um, who are, some are very open, others uh, are um, there are there are all options open. So uh, comp leader teams, which where they already have access or are aware of of, of the global uh, others, maybe is a little bit lacking behind because there is the focus too much or just do the technology. And uh, so, and, and this is always the interesting thing to get to know the teams. And uh, and then to see okay how 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 can we support or uh, what which kind of yeah team member is missing um, and yeah this is then the challenge also for for us on because it's always our focus is always in the early stage uh, and uh, there is often that uh, it's not complete yet. I want to ask about a portfolio company of yours, Femtum, that took in 3.75 million uh, in January and, and less led the round. Um, but there was participation from, for example, the, the venture arm of Hamamatsu. Mm -hmm. That's obviously great for the photonics community when you're getting um, input and influence from, from different leading companies. But is there an element of competition there at this point? Um, actually, um, not at all. So uh, as I said, for, for, for us, 
as a because we are a very small uh, investment firm and we we are a very young and 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 uh, um and, and not young personally <laughs> young from the from <laughs> being being in this investment space uh the uh, they bring a lot of knowledge to the table that we are benefiting from on the other hand uh, we bringing a lot of new technology they're benefiting from so um we, we don't see any competition on that side so and, and uh, since this uh, investment just started uh, we we put a lot of hopes um uh, and we have that with other investment uh, investments too that there is um a lot of good um vcs which are extending our network and it's more a corporation than a uh, than a competition was that the vision or has that been the vision uh moving forward you hope to get that sort of uh participation globally from leading photonics companies who have the knowledge and the the establishment that can push this forward not ne not necessarily from the get-go it's, it's like it was it developed and and the first investment showed where we were strictly wanted to do it ourselves only us um we saw okay it has a lot of benefit to uh, cooperate with other because everybody brings knowledge to the table was there um at any point was there any for a a thought to just keep this internal to to german companies because obviously you want to work with what you understand right and you're based in germany you know that landscape quite well but there's obviously much broader opportunity you talk about china canada us um at what point did it occur that global was the the avenue to pursue maybe one reason is because we right from the beginning were international so with FICONTECH our first customers were in the US and we were we are traveling constantly to uh, east coast west coast we are at the shows in in China so uh, and there you see and uh, participate from from the mark movements and and also um, in Europe is still a little bit behind what uh, what yeah entrepreneurship um, how deal with business how to grow business is it, there is we see US as still as a kind of benchmark for it and uh, and then to connect the dots this would profit. Uh, Europe and and uh, in that way from the spirit and, and and for us yeah it is more like more or less we it was then given and then we followed the, this this path. I would expect that any fears or concerns that you both have for the future of the photonics industry is less about the tech and, and perhaps more about things like um, the entrepreneurial spirit or the supply chain or, or things like that. Um, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. What concerns do you have um, as an investment arm that has to you know, sustain itself and grow moving forward? Um, so tech is definitely not uh, the 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 fear um that's 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 uh, right what you said because uh it's it's there's so much there's so much development there's so much uh um uh, new things happening uh, currently that uh, that there's enough uh base to invest in um the 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 fear is definitely to have enough teams with the inter entrepreneurial spirit because that's specifically in, in germany i think that's uh something which is not taught enough or um um you don't we don't have enough of that in in specifically german uh, uh germany uh to move that forward um other than that um or the the uh, global crises which have an impact on on uh on potential investments which you don't foresee or don't have under control is there in building off of that question, is there an expectation for how, um, you know, I don't want to again make this specific to Germany, but is there a, a roadmap or a plan that you foresee emerging to help alleviate some of the things that can be controlled that the you know, entrepreneurial spirit is obviously easier to control than unforeseen global crisis? Um, are there solutions beginning to emerge? Mm, there's so we have a lot of cooperation with uh with uh, r d institutes um uh, around the world um and and specifically in, in uh, due to the uh, european european way of funding also in the european uh community 
Um, it's actually something we cannot change because it's an educational uh, topic. We can just help and support, but we cannot change um, um, the education system in general. So for that, um, I would I'd rather look at uh, institutions like EPIC um, in Europe or Optica in, in the US, um, um, SPAE, who are really have to move into the R&D areas and, and try to set up educational worlds, which are not struck strictly uh, focus on technology, but also on how to market these technology. One of the realities um, in in Europe versus the U.S. is that Europe has the the IMEX, the Lettys, the Fraunhofer's, born for Nam You know, U.S. has national labs, but primarily it's it's university based. Are there advantages to both systems, or is one um, from where you sit better than the other? Hmm. I would not really comment on that right now. Okay, fair <laughs> I mean, enough. Fair enough. A difficult question because yeah. I think it's, uh, I mean, in Germany, um, these are institutions which has a great uh, history, and uh, out of this came a lot of good uh, companies or ideas, and uh, definitely it's diversified, so it brings. Uh, some positive aspects, but uh, you know, sometimes maybe uh, prevents uh, uh, economy uh, or young companies in uh, yeah uh, to grow because uh, sometimes there is are competition situations. Um, but uh, yeah, so but it, it yeah, it's hard to say or hard to chart. Yeah. But for the, sure, the the U.S. organizations they have a better um passed into into a kind of um prioritize and and, and market uh, that yeah. technology yeah uh, it's, it's an interesting consideration i don't you know like it's interesting no matter who you ask in photonics because it seems to affect potentially just about everyone um no matter the technology i'll end with this i mean how does ls plan to measure success over the next five ten years will it be size of portfolio will it be recognition of the the portfolio companies will it be um money earned money spent? Sure we, do, we, we, <laughs> we don't do it as charity but uh is that not 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 necessarily our first driving factor so the reason why we we started that was because uh, we actually figured out how difficult it is to um get to the first funding as a, a young company or as a, a young team. And this is exactly the hurdle we want to we wanted to break because it's it usually have to do with institutional uh, investors at that stage. And um, they, they bring a lot of bureaucracy, uh, which a young company doesn't need. So Matthias and I have a rather uh, pragmatic approach um to evaluate companies that mean doesn't mean that it's easy to get money from us but uh, at least uh, um we have a that i would say pragmatic approach to that and is that our uh, and, a, and a parameter to measure would be uh, companies successfully fund uh, funded after let's, let's say 10 years and I, I actually will will um, I, I lied. I'll end on this question here. Uh, if you're a young company, what qualities do you look for? Obviously, the technology has to be there, and you have to be able to articulate the value. Are there any other factors or qualities that make a, a potential company particularly appealing to you two? So, I, I think our strength is that we don't have any regulations. So we are. <laughs> We are open. Uh, um, we are open for. Um, we have an open mindset. So, uh, of course, there are some certain guidelines. You no, know, it has to be startup and uh, uh, photonics industry. Um, but the configuration of the team or uh, market uh, within the photonics, we we we, we just listen. Try to understand the business model, evaluate it, and then see: okay, is it attractive or not for us? Can do? Can we? And this is also for us. Uh, um, and this is how we did the business more than 20 years. Uh, 
we have been doing that that we, that we see okay is it on a on a on a human uh, basis do we understand each other can because this is for us important when it becomes difficult or when it will be a difficult time it's easier you no know, when you have a good understanding to to solve the problems together and then also to profit together in the future and is that uh, that we we just uh, we just learned that uh, um um, through some, yeah, uh, not very positive examples. Uh, so we learned our lessons on expect specifically on that side. Well, very good. Continued success moving forward. Um, you know, obviously some lessons are harder to learn than others, um, but it was certainly insightful to speak with you both earlier this year at Photonics West, and I appreciate the time today. Yeah, very nice. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. With that, we conclude another episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our sponsors, to the technical staff behind the scenes, and to continued support from the Photonics Media Editorial Team. As always, questions, comments, thoughts, and ideas are welcome. Let us know how we're doing via email at allthings@photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms and on our website, photonics.com. <laughs>